Brilliant ideas, powered by Hyundai Motor. Tate Modern, in the heart of London. At its core is the Turbine Hall, the biggest and most challenging exhibition space in the world. Each year, the prestigious Hyundai Commission offers one artist the chance to take on this vast space and make it their own. This year, it's French artist Philippe Pereno. He's facing the challenge of filling the Turbine Hall. Philippe Pereno works in many media. He uses cutting-edge technology to weave together film, sound design and sculpture. His exhibitions explore complex ideas about time, memory and the boundaries between reality and fiction. It was complicated for me to declare being an artist. You know, we want to define the, you know, that there was a, a way to be an artist without really producing objects. You know? We're interested by ideas, really, more than anything. You know? I think all of his work operates in this very nebulous region between fact and fiction. He's not asking you to understand. Who is the master? Who is the slave? He's asking you to participate. I think he sits in the future. He has thinkers with him. He has scientists with him. He has musicians with him. Uh, you propose him something, he, and you say to him, Maybe we go too far, and he's looking, you never go too far. You, you should go much, much, much farther. I mean, he touches on life and death. He touches on uh, where does our future lie. I hate to uh, make grand statements about artists, but I think he makes you feel um, the complexity and difficulty and pleasures of what it's like to be alive. Born in 1964, Philippe grew up in Grenoble, France. For a small city, it had a lively cultural scene. He became interested in art while studying maths at university, but never saw himself becoming an artist. At the time, Grenoble was a leftist kind of like city, so I was really lucky coming from a working class background to have a, a lot of input you know, from the teachers. I was exposed, basically, to all these things, you know? Music, theatre, uh, cinema, uh, culture was kind of familiar. When you come from a working-class background, it's really hard to decide to become an artist, because, you know, you have to get your living. While at art school in Grenoble, Philippe started helping out at pioneering gallery Le Magasin. It was led by curator Jacques Guillot, who became his mentor. There, Philippe was introduced to the work of many celebrated artists. The director at the time, Jean, uh, Jacques Guillot, who was the director of the magazine, was a fantastic man, who took me and on his shoulder, so we were kind of like protected and it's again sort of like a privilege to be exposed to uh, so many practice, you know. And uh, so I guess I, will, I, will, I was lucky. Philippe, right from the beginning, has been really skeptical about the process of art or an art career, if you'd like. It wasn't that he had a proposition or a clear idea, but he knew what he didn't like. So Philippe had this really strong position of, of rejecting things, but at the same time being incredibly interested in, in the modern world. Well, the work is very conceptual, and it doesn't pretend it's not. It intentionally is incredibly intellectual in what it does and touches on ideas around philosophy and meaning in a kind of broad way. So what made their work really exciting at the time, I think, was that the practice that was beyond a single exhibition in a single space. There was really a feeling of collaboration and thinking about art outside the box. Philippe was fascinated by the way people behave when gathered together. He started thinking about his exhibitions as a way to explore these types of behaviour. I was interested by the rituals, you know, that I will see forming, you know, and uh, the same that you have when you go to see a football game or to see a theatre play, or you know. I was interested by what I will see, but also by the structure that will allow something to happen, you know. And uh, as a structure, I call it exhibition at the end, you know. Yeah. 
And I think if you're a skeptical person and you are distrustful of the way things are, and yet you still want to be part of something, it can take you a long time to find a form. And I think it's only when he realized that the entire exhibition was the form that he starts to become free. Philippe noticed a newspaper article about the market for discontinued manga characters in Japan. It became the seed for a long-term series of artworks called No Ghost, Just a Shell, in collaboration with Pierre Wieg. I was never designed to survive. It's true. Everything I'm saying is true. The artworks explore what human rights might mean when applied to a fictional character, Anne Lee. I am a product. This idea of how can you die if you never existed. So there was all this kind of like notion of uh, being alive, you know, and uh, this fiction can, can be declared a living organism. Some other characters had the possibility of becoming a hero. They were really expensive when I was cheap. At the end, we wanted to give back the copyright to the character itself. And that was also an interesting part, to blur a bit the boundary between fiction and reality, you know, and to see if, uh, if a fictional character could have a bit of the right that we have as human. It's how I used to be, and this is how I look now. The idea of the, this sort of person online or in a computer space with its own meaning and identity and cognizance, I think has had huge impact afterwards. There's a kind of darkness in a lot of his work, and that's when it becomes personal, because it becomes about him. It touches on ideas of you know, what c constitutes a real person. What do you need to become an individual? I am an imaginary character. I am no ghost, just a shell. French artist Philippe Perreno works in Paris. Out of his studio in Belleville in the northeast of the city, he creates multi-sensory exhibitions that are shown across the world. He's perhaps best known for his beautiful, haunting films, painstakingly researched and produced to the highest possible specifications. One such film is Invisible Boy, a cinematic portrait of a person without a public identity. A portrait of, uh, of somebody who doesn't have access uh, or they can produce an image. So I investigated, we did some research and find uh, at the end by chance a, a little boy. His subject was a child living undocumented in New York. The boy's mother was a Chinese immigrant who was working as a prostitute. Philippe spent time with the boy to understand the reality of illegal aliens in Manhattan's Chinatown. When I met him, I was fascinated by the paranoiac world. You know, it's a paranoiac portrait, as I said. You know. It's uh, him uh, throughout the city, or this paranoia throughout the city, and what he sees that we can't see, you know? The beautiful film with that little boy in Chinatown who is kind of slightly haunted by this creature who may or may not be there. And I think it really gets to that aspect of all children's experiences of the world, of what's real, what's not, what should I be afraid of, what shouldn't I, that we all continue to carry with us. We just find ways to make our world work. But those invisible or gently drawn demons are still there. And I think he, you know, he understands that implicitly is both the exterior and interior life of this child, his fears, um, his dreams, as well as this very compressed, seedy fluorescence of that particular part of the city and about belonging and not belonging there. That's fantastic empathy, this film, but never sentimental. And, and in a way, it's reflecting our own sense of Maybe we're all illegal immigrants. Should we really be here? On June the 8th, 1968, a train traveling through the American countryside 
transported the body of assassinated Robert Kennedy from New York to Washington, D.C. Philippe made a film inspired by the photographs taken by Paul Fusco of the onlookers lining the tracks. I was interested, like, what if you have the point of your dad? The dead looking at the living. And I saw the picture that, uh, by chance, that uh, was uh, taken by Paul Fusco during the funeral of Kennedy. And I was fascinated by the pictures because they were precisely that. People were looking at the event, and I was, look I was looking through the point of view of the event. So we shot in 68 millimeter and projected in a way where the, the people on screen were the same size and the people in the audience. And because they were, we shot in 68 millimeters, the quality of the picture was also the light, you know, it was, the definition was as precise as, uh, as the audience in the, in the museum. So, so I wanted to create a sort of like weird, a spectral kind of a mirror. He wants to have a kind of hyper-realistic. He wants he want the things to be bigger than real. So I want to record the, the train as if it was an orchestra, okay? So instead of bringing one, two, three mic, I bring like 24 mic. So I wanted to give the feeling that it was m more than real. What we are looking at a lot of the time is people waiting, people waiting beside the rail track. Um, people in the distance playing in a pool or, or just going about their day uh, so that the, the occasion is, if you like, passing through the movie whereas life is kind of going on around them and he's as interested in, in, in all those peripheral things as he is in the central action. What uh, you have is basically a film, you know, but the film is only a part of the scenario, so to speak. There's always a meta-language, you know, that uh, which I call exhibition, you know. The past comes back to haunt us in another of Philippe's films. It goes to extraordinary lengths to recreate one of the most iconic figures of the 20th century. The vestibule is lit by two brass sconces. The walls are covered by Jamestown blue wallpaper. One door leads to the hallway, one door to a closet. When Fragments, a collection of Marilyn's personal notes and letters was published, Philippe wanted to explore the difference between the private person it revealed and the instantly recognizable public persona we all know. And I was fascinated by the text, and uh, I thought it's interesting because it's a, maybe the first time that uh, an image killed its owner, you know, its uh, subject, no? And I was fascinated by the handwriting, and uh, could we, in fact, produce a machine that will uh, write like that? A park of 51 people. Set in the Waldorf Astoria in New York, a hotel where the star often stayed, it features a handwriting machine and voice reconstruction to conjure up her presence. Under one of the windows, an open book lies on a beige sofa, and a few magazines on a walnut coffee table. You want to believe that it's her, in fact, you understand at the end it's sort of mechanic construction, you know, and the, the voice is really her, the handwriting is her, but then you understand it's a machine, so it becomes a bit uh, spooky, you know? to make somebody alive again. It's like Frankenstein, you know? Before the, the shooting, we actually had a clairvoyant. The time to shoot a ghost, you know, so that's why the clairvoyant and all these things were important to me, but to try to bring that kind of like uh, uh, ghost in the machine kind of thing. I've often thought of his work also um, kind of operating with what I would call peripheral vision. There's often, like in the case of the Marilyn video, where you never see the subject. The subject is only thought about, spoken about, recorded, 
but the presence is never visually there. And I, I think that that haunting is at the presence of much of his work. There's a sort of emptiness there, uh, but it's to do with the un unknowability of the real person. Uh, you think you're in this hotel apartment and the rain is falling outside and we hear Marilyn, we hear the phone going, but no one ever answers. There's this sense of, if you like, introspection, even though we don't see the subject ever. Uh, and there's this sense of impending, something impending. And eventually the, the camera pulls back on a track and you realise that you're not in this space, you're in a completely fabricated apartment. He destroys the illusion. But that too is an illusion. And it keeps going on flip-flopping between the real and the not real. On the other side, next to the entryway, an armchair, a coat rack, and a suitcase. French artist Philippe Pereno is about to open one of the most high-profile commissions of his career at Tate Modern's cavernous Turbine Hall. It is literally one of the biggest events in the arts calendar. The eyes of the whole art world are on him. The Turbine Hall is a space of epic proportions. It's a monumental space. The interesting thing in relation to Philippe's practice, how do you create a monumental work without necessarily creating a singular object. Philippe has created a multifaceted exhibition. It features a floating helium fish, a film featuring a cuttlefish and ventriloquist Nina Conti, 84 suspended speakers, an array of mechanically controlled screens, and in collaboration with Liam Gillick, a lamp marking the passage of the sun outside. Philippe's vision is for all these elements to come together to create an immersive experience, just like a walk in a park. The, the entire Tate Turbine Hall becomes a kind of gigantic organ, which is played from end to end. The sound of rain will come through, or an aeroplane will seem to actually not just be outside in the skies over London, but actually roaring through the Turbine Hall. Then you'll have moments of extreme quiet and works which slow you down and make you ponder things in very different ways. It's the fact that it's free, people can come back, then when you come back, when you see something again, you see it from a different perspective in between then and now. A bit like when you go to a park, you know, your relation to the park, you spend to the bar, would be different each time you go there because you bring also your own energy to it. Like, uh, like spending a day in a park or, or, or seated at a cafe table outside in a city, the day goes by, you know, the weather changes, the atmosphere changes, how it feels in the afternoon is different from nine in the morning. Everyone in the turbine hall in that work is in a way a participant. Yeah, in a way it's kind of life affirming, it's a, and it doesn't forget ordinary, you know, the manutier of the everyday, I, I like that with the Tate and why it works, are based on the idea of trusting people, that when they come to a place, they all know what to do and how to behave. And I think that's a really powerful thing that's gone on through the work. Coming from a fairly straightforward background, he was once the person who walks into a gallery and doesn't know what the hell they're supposed to be doing. So he still trusts that person, and he still has empathy with that person. A colony of yeast conducts the whole show from a control room in the corner. Connected to a weather station on Tate Modern's roof, the microorganisms react to atmospheric changes, turning on and off the elements of the exhibition in an ever-changing sequence. I thought this would be interesting that, you know, that uh, the entire space, large and big, controlled by small organisms, when he uses yeast that are controlling things, it's almost unreal to think about it, but it's real. You can go and see them. 
and understand how far advanced he is in his thinking. By asking us how one creates artificial life, he touches on life and death. Where does our future lie? It's something that's very much on the minds of scientists today. He's not giving us an answer, but he's asking us to ask our own questions. There is this um, uh, feeling that, in a way, there are things you can't control. And that calls into question the idea that, of responsibility, like to what extent is an artist responsible for their work. What he's doing is taking a system and a series of effects and putting them into motion. And after that point, he becomes as much of a viewer as anyone else. And that is one thing that really marks out his work compared to some other people. There are lights that flash, there are walls that come down, there are different video screens. You would literally have to spend probably six or seven hours for the whole thing to unfold. Everything that he has done before somehow enters into everything he does now. So it's a very enveloping experience in which you participate. The idea that it's something in flux, you're not just going and seeing a single thing, and I think that's a much more contemporary view of what artwork can be. So maybe a lot better than some of the pieces there that have just been a single object. It's like his work is the opposite of an Instagram photograph, where you just have something flat and digital and on a screen. Here, he takes something digital and makes it three-dimensional. He makes it immersive, he makes it environmental, and I find that so much more exciting. It's not about common experience. It's about being able to take fragments of something and build your own experience in the museum. It's not all about focusing on one thing. It's about hearing something in one ear and catching something in the corner of your eye and feeling the skies coming down towards you and then being bumped on the head by a little fish. I do believe that form and art can change the world, you know, for sure. And uh, I do believe that uh, we don't need between uh, us always an object, you know. But that I'm not preaching, you know, anything. I'm just like doing my, I'm just doing my uh, my thing, which is again uh, to produce exhibition, really, you know. And uh, and hopefully produce a temporary form of collectivity. It's true. Everything I'm saying is true. Artists have the job of showing us things which are in the world which we would not notice otherwise. There was no London Fog before Turner, and there was no swimming pool before David Hockney. You know, at a certain moment, artists show you the thing you see all the time or experience all the time but have never isolated. Suddenly it becomes visible, and I think what Philippe is doing is making visible the invisible. Who is the master? Who is the slave? You look at the painting and uh, years later you see it again, it's different. It's different because literally it's different. You're different, the painting change over time. Colors are not the same. The, the surrounding is not the same. Therefore, so everything changed and moved around time. So I choose to see how something can change over time, like you do. Brilliant ideas, powered by Hyundai Motor.